Good morning Endeavour and a very happy Friday to you. We've made it another week and I have been blown away by all your work this week. Working so hard, it's great to see. Well done guys, I'm really really proud of you. Yesterday I did what I normally did at school didn't I? And I left it on a cliffhanger. Yes I know, we might be in lockdown but it doesn't mean that I have to stop doing what we normally do at school. Well, let's see what today brings because our chapter is called The Ruined City. The man was tall. His arms and hands were covered in scars and burns, old white scars crisscrossed with red new ones. He held the knife at a level of their necks, casually, as if it were a breadstick. Them, whispered Con. At the man's side, close to his heels, waddled an enormous vulture with a red head and a curved beak. His head came up higher than the man's knees. A small person in the dollar's trouser suit. The man's nostrils had a high flare to them and they twitched as he spoke. His voice deep, his accent for thought belonged among good tailoring and fast motor cars. What's wrong with him? There was silence except for Max's sobs. Well, said the man. He twirled the knife in his fingers. The tip of his thumb was missing. Crying, said Fred. Why, he sounds like a dying screech owl. Like a lion blowing on a ship's whistle. Fred's heart was red hot and beating double time. He was surprised that his voice sounded so calm. He's five. That's not a reason. You're pointing a knife at his head, said Lila. That's not a good reason. But he lowered the knife. The man stepped closer into a patch of green sun and they could see him more clearly. His dress was exquisite but smelt pungent. His trousers, spread thought, were quite ordinary. Green khaki worn through at the knee and spotlessly clean. But that, along with his white shirt torn off at the elbow and patched with coconut fibre, was the only thing about him that was normal. His shoes were made from what looked like alligator skin with very thin binds for shoelaces. His jacket, so neatly from black furs, hung over his shoulders. The buttons were Cayman's teeth. He wore leather cuffs on each wrist and a signet ring on his little finger. From a distance he might have been on his way to a country house party. Up close he looked as though he had reconstructed a prime minister from once living things. Com swallowed. Look in a whisper. Is it just me, or does he look like the kind of person who won't definitely not kill you? Her eyes were stretched open and her skin was taut over her bones in her face. Red's entire body had gone rigid, spine and shoulders and knees frozen, but he managed to nod his head half a centimetre. He spoke out of the corner of his mouth. Not just you. The man took another step towards them. His right leg swung slightly out to the side as he moved. Fred noticed for the first time that his right foot was strapped with three slim, highly polished pieces of wood. Despite the limp and the scars and the stubble, the animal Fred thought of was a panther, something with strong jaws and sharp manners. Who are you? said the man. None of the children answered. They looked at each other. Nobody wanted to speak first. How did you get here? said the man impatiently. Fred tried to take a deep breath. Our plane crashed, he said, and the pilot died, and we followed a map. He put his hands in his pockets, attempting to look nonchalant, while trying to find something he could fight with if he needed to. He could only find a handful of squashed decay berries, which would not be very deadly in a battle. Show me. Fred handed him a scrap of bark, fumbling in his back pocket, his fingers suddenly uncooperative and clumsy. The man glanced at it. Who drew this? Silently, Con raised her hand. Based on what? Con sh shook her head, so her hair fell in a protective wave across her face. Well, said the man. We found a map in a tree, said Fred, and Con made a copy when it got wet. The man screwed up the bark in his hand. Please, said Lila, don't be angry. All we want to do is go home. The man looked down at the vulture as if for inspiration. And what am I, I supposed to do with you now? 
Nothing. Just let us stay for a little. We won't make any noise, said Lila. That small one will. Max felt the man's gaze fall on him and he began to cry again. The man let out a sound that was somewhere between a sigh and a <clears throat> growl. Lila picked Max up. Sorry. Her voice wavered and back caught fear from her skin and let out a mew like a cat. It's only she whispered. You all keep saying that as if it's an explanation. Should I like him simply because he's small? I do not like undercooked food. Children are just undercooked adults. Con's lip began to quiver. Fred looked at her, surprised, but he moved his shoe half an inch so their feet touched. The man looked at them, ranged in a line in front of him, shaking with nerves and expectation. He sighed. Are you thirsty? he asked. Yes, said Fred. Very, said Lila. Very, very, said Max. He sniffed tearfully and wiped a great wedge of snot on his wrist. Wait here, he glared at Max. Don't touch the vulture. He bites when he's anxious and it takes very little to make him anxious. Vultures have nervous souls. The man strode across the great stone courtyard. He stopped at a tree trunk, a stump of wood as wide as a well, and lifted a slab of stone off its top. Fred shielded his eyes and stared. The tree trunk had been hollowed out and it was full of water. The man dipped a large green bowl into the water and stomped back to them. Here. He thrust the bowl at Fred. The ring on the man's finger wasn't gold, Fred saw. It was bone, coated in flakes of iridescent snake scales. Fred looked at the bowl in his hands. It was made from an explorer's pit helmet. The brim of the hat bent into a lip. Fred sniffed it. And the man raised his eyebrows. I assure you it's perfectly clean, he said. Fred took a gulp. Thankfully, it didn't taste of hair, only a little of wood and birds in the rainforest. He drank deeply and then passed it to Lila, who handed it to Max, who dumped his whole head in the hat. The man waited until all four had drunk, and then he took back the bowl and offered it to the vulture. As the vulture drank, the man rested his hand on the bird's head and stroked its wattle with his thumb. His face was tense. What is it that you want? He said. The children looked at each other. We want help to get home, said Lila, and she spoke very quietly, so quietly that he had to bend down to hear. And why should I? I can't look after Max much longer. He has allergies and nightmares, and I don't know how I can dress him, and he keeps ripping holes in his clothes. Please help us. As she spoke, the vulture waddled away from the man's side and headed straight for Max, who was hiccuping and sniffing, a line of snot dripping from his nose onto his ankle. The vulture dipped its beak to Max's feet and pecked at the knot. Then it wedged its nose into the side of Max's shoe and breathed in deeply through the holes in his beak. What's he doing? said Max. His eyes were dilated with fear, round as pennies, and he reached down and touched the bald head of the vulture. Max snatched his hand back and then more confidently returned it to the vulture's head. It let out a guttural choke, which made it, which sounded like a purring. Then Max looked up, smiling at the man. He's mine now, he said. The man looked from Max to the vulture and back at Fred and Lila and Con. His face was emotionless, but his eyes were not. I shouldn't trust the instincts of that bird, he said. He probably just thinks the boy smells like meat, but all right, come with me. He led them down the stone boulevard. There was a cascade of questions tumbling through Fred's head. Who was the man? How had he got here? Would he help them? But something in the man's walk did not encourage conversation. The canopy was so thick overhead that the light filtered a succulent green down on their path. The man led them to a place where blocks of stone and mud had been stacked to make three sides of the storeroom. It was empty but for the shocking blue and green flowers which grew in the cracks. Bang crisscrossed over the top forming a roof of sorts. Here, said the man, you can sleep here. Who built this? Did you? No, he said shortly. I did not. He looked at the stone floor. I might let you make some reed sleeping mats tonight, if I have time. The vines will shelter you if there's any rain, more or less. Thank you, said Fred. Con still hadn't spoken, but she nodded in thanks. But beyond the statues, the curtain of lianas you see, 
he pointed. Fred followed his hand and saw at the far end of the city square, falling from the wall behind the statues, a great swathe of tangling creepers. They nodded. You don't go anywhere near there, do you understand? That is my private space. Con tried to speak, but only a strangled burr came out. We understand, said Lila. I mean it. Keep your word or I'll cut off your ears and give them to the vulture to wear as a hat. Don't, wailed Max, and he put his hands over his ears. I don't like him. Shh, Max, said Lila. He doesn't mean it. Fred looked at the man. He was fairly sure Lila was right, but it seemed risky to assume a man who used teeth for buttons was joking. Max tugged at the man's trousers. What time do we eat? The man looked down at him, baffled. Whenever you want. Oh, but we mean whenever suits you, said Con. Her voice was croaky, but she looked relieved that it had started working again. You eat whenever you catch and cook something. That's usually how it works, unless you don't catch anything. But don't you... You're the adult. I am an adult, certainly. Look, there are berries. There may be some bananas on the trees in the west corner if they weren't eaten by the monkeys in the night. And you can hunt. But, but, said Con, you're grown up. Her voice had truly come back now and she scowled. Grown ups cook for children. Those are the rules. That's how it's always been done. The man seemed to be losing his patience. My dear, he crouched in front of her, dangerously close. What aspect of this? And he waved his hand at the stone pillars, at his scaly shoes, at the vulture. Makes you think that I would care how things have always been done. But that isn't how the world really works. This is the real world. And he thumped his knuckles on the stone floor. This here, the real world, is where you feel most real. You are, said Fred. But please, said Lila. But don't you, said Con. Nor three reached out as if to grab him. Good Lord, said the man. It's like watching a doggy to be. You have six hands between you, or eight if you can't small one, trying to eat a dragonfly. Max, said Lila, stop it. Do you at least have knives? The man asked. We have one between us, said Fred. We found it. It didn't seem the right moment to explain technically the knife almost belonged to this tall, dark, unexpectedly dressed stranger. He might demand they give it back. Oh, I'll give you all a flint, said the man, then you can hunt at least. He crossed to another stump of a tree trunk and lifted a small boulder off its top and fished out something from the hollow space within. Here, they're already sharpened. He handed them each a stone, expertly chiselled to the size of a large arrowhead. Fred tested the edge with his thumb. It bit into his skin and a drop of blood ballooned out. The man raised his eyebrows. You can use banana leaves as bandages. If you lose any fingers worth eating, give them to the vulture. He handed a stone to Max. There you are, young cacophony. That one's the sharpest. Max is too young for knives, said Lila. She tried to take it from her brother, but he jerked away and held both hands behind his back. Is he, said the man. How do you know? He sounded interested. It is just a fact. People don't give little boys knives. I'm fairly sure I was given a knife to young age and I turned out perfectly normal. Fred looked on the buttons on the man's shirts. They glinted white and sharp in the sun and he said nothing. The man sighed. It's getting late, he said. You can have something from my own stores, but just tonight. Don't think it's going to be a routine. You have to hunt for yourself. All four let out deep sighs of relief. The man strode back to the hollowed out trunk and bent into a pile of stones next to it. Up close there seemed to be arranged something more definite than a pile, a rectangle with wide slabs across the top. The man lifted the two slabs and reached in and brought out the body of a bird, plucked it, and ungutted it. A cara cara, he said, and he dropped it into Fred's hands. It was cool and clammy. They're common as rats here. Thank you. Could you tell us how to sort it out? Fred asked tentatively. With the flints, boy. But how's the best way, sir? He added, just in case. When the first man learned to cook, he did so without a recipe book and it worked out. You work it out. The four of them stared at him. He sighed. <sighs> cut along the stomach, scoop out anything that looks too detailed and cook the rest. A rule of thumb, with innards, it would take more than one colour to draw it. Don't eat it. So kidneys are fine, all reddish brown, intestines less so, unless you're feeling exceptionally brave. But just quickly before you go, how do we cook it, said Lila. 
with fire? He smiled a half smile. Or that one, the blonde one, wearing her face like a weapon in a barroom bar brawl, could try to cook it by glaring at it. Wait, please, just a second. Fred made a last effort as the man turned to go. Who are you? What do we call you? What is this place? How did you get here? Are you an explorer? Do you live here? Are you planning to help us? We need to know. Fred thought of all the explorers he'd read about. There were so many who had strode into the jungle and never reappeared. Percy Fawcett and his son Jack, Rally Rimmel, Christopher McLaren. He tried to remember the photographs that they looked like in the newspaper. The man turned to face Fred full on. His face shifted from wry to something darker and harder to trace. I'm a pilot, not an explorer. I used to ferry supplies back and forth from smaller towns to Manus. I crashed here some time ago. What happened to your plane? What happened to yours? He countered. It's burnt, said Fred. The man nodded. Exactly so. And your name? I'm Fred, and that's Lila and Con and Max. A look as blank as an iron wall came down over the man's face. I'm not interested in names. This is the Amazon jungle, not the Travellers Club on Pall Mall. But what do we say then, asked Khan. I, I mean, if we need your attention. His eyebrows went up so high they nudged his hairline. You don't, he said and turned away. He strode across the square, his shoulders hunched, heading towards the place where the vines grew in an impenetrable curtain. He pushed past some branches and disappeared. His footsteps, despite the limp, were astonishingly silent. You scared him off, Max said to Con, his voice full of accusation. It wasn't me, we all did it, said Con, and technically I think we annoyed him off. I don't know, said Lila, that's asking someone's name would be so controversial. I know what we call him, said Max, and he beamed proudly. We call him the Explorer. But he's just said he's not one, said Con, exasperated. Weren't you listening? He's got an Explorer's hat, said Max, and a vulture. So there. Right, guys, I'll join you on Monday to find out all about the man, the explorer. Have a great weekend, guys, and enjoy the day today. I look forward to seeing all your pictures. See you soon.